Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome to the latest installment of Benny is a nincompoop. Let's run our application for a moment. Now you see, we got a mesh, we've got lighting, that's nice and all. But our lighting is seems a little bit off somehow, doesn't it? I mean, the edges of the shadow seem a little hard, the specular reflection looks almost like a texture just being pasted onto it rather than an actual lighting effect. So what's going on? Why doesn't our realistic lighting look realistic? And the answer is in our Render Util class. In here, we're doing GL Enable, GL Frame Buffer sRGB. And the idea here is that it'll adjust incoming color so it's in proper RGB format when it reaches the monitor. And that's great, but here's the problem with that. What format are we loading our textures in? Well, you can say PNG, JPEG, or whatever, but at the end of the day, there's still an RGB format. So we're loading colors in, in an RGB format. Here's the problem. Why would we need to adjust RGB colors to be proper RGB format if they're already proper RGB format? You don't. So this is a complete and utter waste, and it's making our light look less realistic. And I might as well go ahead and do this. GL enable GL depth clamp. And all that's going to do is, it's going to prevent our camera from being able to clip through our mesh. So, if you disable this, sometimes you can get really close to the mesh and sort of have the camera half inside and half outside. But with this enabled, that prevents that from happening. And I'll change, I'll get rid of the cyan mask here so that we get a more accurate portrayal. And now if I run, I don't know about you, I mean, it does look a little different than what we're used to, but... I don't know about you, but this lighting looks a lot more like what I'd expect from reality. I mean, the spectral reflection looks actually like there's some light reflecting off of it. It seems, yeah, it yeah, it looks like actual realistic lighting. So, yeah, there you go. Sorry I had to waste the first two and a half minutes of video time on that, but I thought it would be worth mentioning that that's why our lighting's been so weird for the past few videos. So. There you go. And now let's actually begin this video's topic. In this video, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding a new type of light. Rather than just having directional lights, which shine an infinitely wide beam of light from some direction, we're going to have a point light, which is some light which has some point and just shines outwards. So, and the first big difference between our directional light and our point light is we can have more than one of them, or at least in this implementation you can. You can do this for directional lights too if you want, but I'm not going to. So, I'm going to have const int called max point lights. And I'm going to initialize this to 4. You don't want to make this too high, because, first off, keep in mind, this is just the number of point lights that will affect a single pixel. You're probably not going to need more than four lights affecting a single pixel. And secondly, it gets really expensive having tons and tons and tons of point light calculations for every pixel in your scene. So, be very careful with which number you choose here. I'm picking four, it's generally a good balance, but you can pick whatever number makes you happy. So, there you go. And now I'm going to create a struct, but not for our point light just yet. This is going to be a struct I'll call attenuation. And what this struct is going to do is it's going to hold all the information for how quickly our point light sort of fades off. Like, sure, it shines light outward from some point, but how quickly does that light sort of weaken if it shines a pixel a million miles away, is that going to be just as bright as shining a pixel one mile away? Or is it going to have a lot of fading out in that distance? You know, stuff like that. And I'm just going to do this with a basic quadratic equation like you did in math. So is it going to hold information for a float constant, float linear, and float exponent? And these three variables are going to sort of describe the terms of some quadratic equation, which describes how quickly the light fades out. 
And if you're curious, the physically accurate version of this is to have exponent at 1 and everything else at 0. So, there you go. And now, let's have a struct for point light. So, this is of course going to have some, well, I'll start with base light. It's going to have some base light, base. It's going to have some attenuation, a 10, describing how quickly it fades off. And of course, it's going to have some vector 3 position for where in the world is this point? I mean, it's not much of a point light if it doesn't have some point. And that's all the information I actually need, so with that, that pretty much sets up the information in the shader. So, now I'm actually going to use all this data I just set up. So I'm going to start by creating a uniform point light. It's called point lights. There's going to be an array of size, num, point lights. Or in other words, oh, I call it max point lights. Excuse me. An array of size max point lights. So that way we just have some giant uniform array of all the different point lights we're going to have for this particular pixel. Now, all the logic is really going to take place in this method called calc point light, which takes in some point light, point light, and it's going to take in the normal, just like calc directional light, except this time it isn't quite as simple, because we do need a calc light, but also we need to do attenuation after that, so that's going to be part of the problem. Another problem is we don't have our direction coming into this. A point light doesn't store a direction. So we're going to need to calculate that. So I'm going to create a vec3 called light direction, and that's going to equal world pos zero, so the position of the pixel, minus the point light dot position. And that's just going to give me what direction the light's in. I'm also going to create a float called distance to light, or I'll call it distance to point, why not? And this is going to just equal the length of light direction. And the reason I'm storing this explicitly is because what I'm going to do next is light direction equals normalize light direction. So that gets me the two pieces of information I want. I know what direction it's in, and it's normalized, so I can use calc light. And I also know how far away this point is, which is going to be good for my attenuation calculation. So I'm going to have a vec4 called color. And this is going to equal calc light of point light dot base. So essentially I'm just calling calc light now. It's going to take in the base light, it's going to take in the direction, and it's going to take in the normal. So now we know what possible eff effect of color is going to come out of the light. Now what? Well, now we have to do the attenuation calculation. And here's how this is going to work. I'm going to have some float called attenuation, which is essentially just going to take the attenuation data structure in the point light and apply the quadratic equation with distance to point as the variable. So it's going to equal point light dot atten, is that what I called it? Yes. Wait. Yes. Okay. So it's going to equal that dot constant plus point light dot. Well, I'll do it on a separate line. Why not? Point light dot atten dot linear times distance to point because well that's a linear variable plus point light dot atten dot exponent times distance. I can spell it right, distance to point, times distance to point. And that's most of what I need. And just to make sure I actually call that exponent. Okay, I just want to make sure my code's correct. So that will calculate the attenuation. And now all we have to do here is return color divided by attenuation. And the reason we're dividing is because this gets bigger as well, this variable, I should say, will get bigger and bigger the bigger the distance is. And we want our light to be weaker and weaker as the distance gets further, so that's why we're dividing. This does have one small problem, though. It's very possible to divide by zero here. And the thing is, if I do if statements, which might seem like the obvious choice, well, the way GLSO works, sometimes it ends up executing both possible code paths of an if statement anyways. So that won't solve it, because it's still going to perform the division by zero. 
So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to add a very, very small number to this. 0 0.0001. And that way, I'm never going to actually divide by 0, assuming none of these are negative, which they shouldn't be. So, yeah. And there you go. Now that makes division by 0, in most cases, impossible, unless you're playing with negative, but at that point you're not using it how you're supposed to, so, yeah. And that should complete our calc point light method. It calculates the point light, figures out the distance, figures out the attenuation, everything's good. So now what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to add that to the total lighting effect. So I'm going to have a for loop. 4 and i equals 0. i is less than max point lights. One thing that I think is very important to mention here, whatever you do, do not make max point lights some non-constant, like you're going to be clever and send some uniform for the amount of lights you're going to want to calculate on. GLSL doesn't handle variable length or variable amount for loops very well. So please don't make this non-constant. It actually ends up performing worse in almost every case if you try sending in the number of point lights. So yeah, that's worth, that's worth mentioning. Although again, if that actually does improve your performance, then by all means go do it, but it's probably not going to. Anyways, back to the main point. Total light plus equals calc point light for point lights sub i. It's pretty straightforward, and of, oh, of course, normal. It's pretty straightforward, there's nothing too fancy about this, but yeah, there you go. That calculates all the, the point lights, and that'll add the total effect third light, and since that's being added to our final color, well, there you go. That's all the shader work we should need to do here. So, yeah, there you go. So, now let's create our wrapper classes. So, just things like an attenuation class and a point light class, so that we can access the same type of data the shader can. So, I'm going to create a new class called attenuation, spelled correctly, there we go. And, it's going to have a private float constant, private float linear, and private float exponent. So, just like with every other one, the same data members as in the GLSL version. And I'm also, just like all the other ones, going to select all of these and generate getters and setters at the end. So, there we go. Now all that's left is a constructor. So, public attenuation. It's going to take in some float constant, float linear, and float exponent. This dot constant equals constant, this dot linear equals linear, and this dot exponent equals exponent. So we're just assigning it to all the values they passed in. And there you go. That's our first wrapper class. Not much to it. So, now let's create a wrapper class for point light. Again, I'm going to try to imitate the GLSL shader as much as possible, so even though it is a base light and technically should be inherited in proper object-oriented programming, I'm going to make it have a base light, just because I want this to match the shader as accurately as possible. And a private vector 3f, position, and I almost forgot, a private attenuation, attenu yeah, I call it a 10. And there. So now, Again, all shift Fs generate getters and setters at the end. And now all that's left is our constructor. So public point light takes in vector 3F position and actually should I take in base light or position first? I'll take in position. I'll take in base light. Base light, base light, vector 3 Attenuation, a 10, and vector 3f position. There we go. So, and then, just like before, this dot base light equals base light. Just assign all the members to the values they passed in. And, there you go. That's all our wrapper classes finished. And unfortunately, that's all the time I have for now. So, in the next video, we're going to take our newfound Fong shader, 
and our newfound wrapper classes, and we're going to integrate them into our shader classes and our game so we can actually see this point light code we put together. So, thank you, hope you enjoyed, hope you learned, and see you next time.